Welcome to this Film Fest DC conversation with two of our filmmakers in our Metro Shirts program. I'm Linda Blackaby, and on behalf of the festival and my co-curator, Juliet Birch, we're just so pleased to have you here um, and to see what they have to say. I want to just introduce our moderator for today, who is Susan Barocas. Susan's been the director of two other film festivals during her career. She's uh, based in Washington, DC. She's been a documentary filmmaker and uh, her other her other professional personal passion is uh, cuisine. She's a she's a chef and a and a writer and a teacher about food. So so welcome, Susan. You take it away. Great, thank you, Linda. It's wonderful to be here and to be with filmmakers, especially. Um, you know, I really appreciate this focus that Film Fest DC has on filmmakers from the DC metropolitan area. Um, there's so much talent here and we have two very talented directors with us today. Uh, I will briefly introduce them just so we kind of start to get a sense of who's who today. And uh, then we'll dive into getting to know their, them through their films. So first, Gregory Edwards. Hi, Gregory. Nice uh, to meet you, hello. Nice to meet you too, in person next time. <laughs> um, so Gregory has had a love for art and animation since you were a child. Um, yes. and after graduating from Sarah Lawrence college in 2017 with a bachelor of arts degree, uh, you enrolled in the Savannah college of art and design graduate animation program and received a master's degree in animation. Um, and you, his ultimate goal, as you said, is to create animated Caribbean focused films and shows for Caribbean children to watch. So we'll get into that. Um, next, uh, we have with us Bob Ahmed. And Bob is a graduate of the New York Film Academy. Um, his award-winning films have been released by Lionsgate, AMC Theaters, American Airlines, uh, and through Global Television, among others. Um, uh, you've been covered on BBC, NBC, Variety, The Plain Dealer, The Village Voice, and now you're here with us. You can add that notch now. Where are you joining us from, Bob? Do we have Bob? I, do, um, I am in West, I'm in West Virginia, location scouting right now, and you can see one of the perils of location scouting it's storming outside. This is West Virginia, the mountains and the forests. This is near Randolph County, um, at Canaan Valley, where they have some, some of the biggest forests and one of the tallest mm. places in West Virginia. Wonderful. Um, well, we're glad you can join us, that there's some reception at least. And we'll dive in. Let's start at the beginning. The beginning being, how did each of you why did you make this film? What connected you to the material specifically? Um, and how did you connect with the story? What was the special lens through which you directed your film? And Gregory, your film is so personal. Why don't we start with you, um, which is uh, an animated film. And why did you want to tell this particular story about your family? Whose perspective is it told from, you know, why did you make some of those decisions? Okay, well, Boxing Day was like, it's three quarters my father's perspective growing up as a young boy in rural Jamaica and one quarter my, my perspective. I wanted to tell this story because like, I think it shows like a true, gives a true, gives everyone like a true perspective of like what it's like to grow up in Jamaica because like, it, on TV and like in the media, there's a rather like stereotypical depiction of like life in Jamaica, which is like beaches and whatnot. And so I think this is like a more accurate representation that people need to see. And nowadays in like film, people, especially in the animation side of, of film, um, that is what like companies and like people are looking to see like more unique stories told by by people who 
you know, may not be like the stereotypical American, but like can relate, it can be relatable to like people from all walks of life. Because growing up, I didn't, when I grew up, like most of the TV that I watched was like from American stations. There weren't any real like local Jamaican animation when I was growing up. It's getting better now, but I wanted to be a part of that and like contribute to that. Mm -hmm. And whose voice is the film told in? Um, the voice the voice is told by Norbert Thomas, who is like a Caribbean voice actor mm -hmm. from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Um, we met. I emailed him and like told and showed like what I wanted to do with the film, and he was like on he was on board to like record with it. And mm -hmm. he had like the perfect voice that I needed because I wanted to tell it like a storybook kind of thing, like an audio book. Right, right. Yes, that does come across that quality. Um, Bob, let's see, Tikkun Olam is a dramatic short. So there's a real contrast there. Um, what drew you to your story? And also, if you could please talk about the title for your film, um, which is a very meaningful phrase um, for uh, Jewish people around the world. Um, so uh, first, the title, Tikkun Olam, uh, means healing the world. And I was inspired by this concept. Uh, there was a great... Um, uh, a philosopher, a theologian, uh, whose name is um, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. He passed away last year. Uh, so he wrote a book to heal a fractured world and the ethics of responsibility. And this is something that always, um, I always thought a lot about. What does it mean to be responsible? And from this comes the concept of how in society, we look away, we look away all the time, whether it's towards racial discrimination or whether it's towards homelessness or whether towards other issues. And it's very easy to do that. Like, you know, it's, it's when, when, when we talk, we say, oh yeah, we should do this. But when a person is within that environment and within a certain group structure, uh, you become part of that. So that a title to, uh, to be, um, the ethics of responsibility, what responsibility means. That's where the title came from. The story in the film is about a young boy who has an encounter with a homeless veteran. And um, the boy does something which, is, uh, uh, which shows our humanity. Basically, we see society looking away from this homeless veteran where he's collapsed on the floor and everyone is walking by. And the young boy represents the best of our humanity, the innocence basically of, of, of hum the innocence of childhood and the innocence of humanity. And what he does by bringing dignity and respect back to the homeless gentleman, uh, that's, that's, that's what the story is about. Okay. And you were drawn to this story because you the, moved the actual, to DC or something? Uh, I, I was working in DC the last few years for an international organization. And there were lots of homeless folk in DC right outside this organization where uh, this organization, the, 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 where it's very affluent, the people there, the, you know, the, everything is very positive about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but right outside this organization, you have people who are sleeping on the floor and we would all just walk by without even looking at the homeless folk. There's not even a debate. And yet there's a big debate. Yes, we need to solve the world problems and the global challenges. But right outside the door, there are people sleeping on the floor and no one is even looking at them. So I myself in the beginning was very conscious of uh, the homeless folk when I joined. And very soon after working in this organization, I started to realize that I too am looking away that I too am um, not, uh, uh, that I, I too am um, not uh, uh, concerned anymore about what's happening. So uh, one day what happened was my brother, he phoned me and he said, um, uh, um, uh, uh, he, my brother said, 
that he had seen a homeless gentleman collapse on the floor and everyone had walked by. And, and then my brother called 911 and ambulance came. And then my brother was very upset. So I became very quiet. And my brother said, why are you so quiet? And I said, yes, people walk up and down. But I too am one of those people who walk by every day. And at that moment, my brother and I decided that we need to make a film on this topic. So the uh, homeless rate in Washington, D.C. is very high. It's um, compared to other states, it's the highest. Compared to other cities in the U.S., it's number 10. Very high, very high. Um, thanks. I'm going to give you a break. Your audio is a little spotty. Hopefully it'll come back. Um, Gregory, let's talk about the actual um, format style that you made your film. And Gregory, I love the color and design in your film. And I know that so much of it is intentional. Uh, you really do get the feeling of the Caribbean. Um, could you talk about um, uh, how you made decisions about this very evocative visual style? I don't think there was a question of you telling the story any other format than animation, given your interest. But if you could talk about, um, you know, kind of how you were influenced as a filmmaker by animation techniques and what choices you made to visually get across your message, your story. Okay, so because it's like a story of like my, my father growing up, I wanted to like make it like evocative of like a children's storybook. So I looked at like some of the story, some of the stories that I grew up with, like reading, like my mom would buy, buy me books for me to read. And like an artist that really stuck with me is um Ezra Jack Keats, who like loved to make, he loved to make stories of like, of like, you know, non-white people of color. Because like the big thing about the snowy day is that he cho he guys sent a picture of this homeless um young black boy and he chose that to to base off of his protagonist peter so i loved how ezra jack keats used collage in most of his artwork mm. so that was like a big inspiration but the second inspiration was more local um i i looked at like african gullah art which is like a distinct style where it's more on like shapes than like actual details. And um, there is a local artist named Bernard Hoyas. He, currently, he grew up in Jamaica. Like he also grew up in rural Jamaica, much like my father and was like inspired by like revivalists, which is like a form of um, religion in Jamaica. And like, he also did Gullah art. And when I looked at his art, it was like, so like it gave off such like strong evocative feelings. So I also used him as an inspiration for what I wanted to portray with my, uh, with my film. Mm -hmm. And using the techniques of collage, where I would, um, how I would do it is that I would buy like one sixteenth inch fabric from the local fabric store, then scan it in, and then combine it with like drawings that I made, like both traditionally and digitally. So that's how I got like my style and my technique. And the result is a layered look. Yes, it is like it is like a very layer upon layer mm -hmm. look. Mm -hmm. And you're happy with the result, I take it. That it tells very, very happy. Yeah. Especially considering like the time and like the current setup that it took me to do because like most of it was like created like at home with my computer due to like the pandemic and going on, which could be difficult at times, but I, but you know, at the end of the day, I'm very happy with, with how it looks. And now, you know, you can create film any place under many. Anywhere I want, yes. As opposed to Bob, who uh, is back with us, hopefully, uh, if you want to unmute, um, your story uh, is told through a drama that you w wrote, which um, and you directed, and you used children as well as adult 
uh, a child as well as adult actors. And I thought it'd be very interesting uh, for you to talk about what it is like to work with actors, particularly particularly children, and um, also how you were choosing locations and other elements in your film to get across what you wanted to say, including your use of archival footage too. Uh, so that's a really um, important question that you asked because for me as a director, when I started out, directed mean, uh, directing meant directing the camera. So, uh, you know, when you come out of film school, the first thing that you want to do is to show people that you can have a professional looking film. And that's where you get excited with an aerial shot or using a dolly or how the camera is moving and how many, how the color correction, what you're filming on. And I realized later on in my career that directing has nothing to do with the camera. It's a director's prerogative. If they want to work and assist the camera, the cinematographer or someone in the catering or the set designer. But for me, directing, what I found was that it means simply one thing, and that is the performances of the actors. And those performances are by contact, by context, by choosing the right people for the right roles and providing them the freedom and the context, not so that you extract a performance, but so that they create a true moment. And I was very fortunate to work with all. So the, what's very special about this film, Tikkun Ulam, is that the entire crew and cast is Washington DC based and yet this film is competing on the international level in many different international film festivals. So especially the cast, you would think that you do not have actors in Washington, D.C. But in fact, you have really, really strong actors mm -hmm. and acting centers in the D.C. area. So I was just fortunate. I auditioned lots of people and I tried my best to learn from the actors and they told me many things. They, they gave me many suggestions, many uh, tips on their character. And I said, hey, why don't you try this? And they said, no, no, my character wouldn't do that. When they started saying that, I knew that they now understood their character. Both the young boy and the other gentleman, the, the one who plays a homeless gentleman, uh, and the mom, all three actors, um, Alexander Fox, Alexander Barnett, Catherine Caruso, they were just stunning, all three of them. So uh, in terms of acting, it's just where the effort goes. So, um, uh, so directing means the actors, of, uh, finding the right actors, focusing on the acting and the performances. And that's something I learned later in my career because you know, you'll be amazed that if you have the right actors, the film even looks better. It's, it's very strange, I, I cannot explain it, but if you have a top quality camera and lights and the top cinematographer, mm -hmm. but if the performances are not there, even the cinematography will not look professional. It's just something that I have seen. It's very difficult to explain. So therefore, when I work on films now, my goal really is just to focus on the performances and getting the right actors and creating an environment so they can create moments for themselves and giving them that space that I can learn from their characters and from the actors so that they're part of the process. Mm. You know, it's, um, it's interesting that you also talk about being a filmmaker in DC, because uh, I did want to ask you both, you, you've answered the question, Bob, but Gregory, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you find being a filmmaker in the DC area. Um, well, being like a new filmmaker, it's like, it's pretty neat. Like, you know, like DC in itself is a bit of a, like an anomalous city because like, you know, it's considered more of a district than like an actual city, but like, you're so close to everything. Like you can be like close to like the hustle and bustle of the city. And then like, at the same time, you could be like two steps later, you're out in the wilderness. So like, 
I think DC has like many opportunities to like make films and like be inspired by like historical film areas and like that ease of convenience. I can see why like there's so many filmmakers in the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are. It is a very rich filmmaking community and African community theater. Yes. Yeah, as you found, Bob. Um, so now let's talk about um, the, the, the short format and the idea of telling your story within the boundaries of a short film. Was it liberating for you? Was it constrictive, restrictive? How, how did you, was it hard? Tell, tell, would each of you talk about that for a minute? And Bob, I see that you are actually not frozen. So let's get, take advantage of the moment and you start if you would. <laughs> um, just a quick note uh, about your previous question. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I agree with Gregory that the, there's a unique opportunity to film in DC, to tell stories in DC and things that people haven't seen. You know, you may see the monuments, but there are many stories taking place, for example, in Shaw or in Southeast. And that's the real DC, which we don't know of. So as filmmakers, this gives us an opportunity to show the world what the real DC is. Uh, in terms, and, and, in, and in terms of uh, the community, there's an organization called Women in Film and Video. And for me, that's provided, I found that very uh, supportive with a lot of resources. And it's just something, I think as a filmmaker, you really need a community. It's not an individual thing to do. Um, so, um, so, Therefore, uh, something like, something like Women in Film and Video, there's also acting community, like this Deb Gottesman uh, acting school, with, you know, they do lots of acting classes. So there's a community coming to your question about shorts. Um, uh, for me, I found it, it's a very different type of storytelling, but it can be equally powerful. And this is a time where shorts are being considered by the public a few years ago. Basically, students made shorts. Now, professional filmmakers make shorts, and Netflix is picking up shorts. On YouTube, you have some of the shorts with millions, millions, hundreds of millions of views. And it's a format that people want to see, where they may say, We only have five minutes, 10 minutes, and we want to get a message instead of sitting for two hours. Mm. Great. Gregory. Yeah, um, I found like, I found like telling things in like a short format very like I found it very liberating because like I wanted to make my um my film just like a story that like kids can sit down and watch and like not necessarily a kid's movie because like if I had to like stretch that out for an hour I think a lot of kids may not have been like as interested mm -hmm. in it because it would be like a lot of like details that like, you know, kids, adults may find it interesting, but like, you know, kids, they want to like read the book. They want to see the pictures and like, they want to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So I think, and like, not even just kids, because like, you know, some adults just want something that they can like pull up and like watch for like maybe like two to three minutes and like find it enjoyable. So I found like shorts the perfect way to like tell my film. Mm. It's so interesting because um, it sounds like for both of you, the form itself was part of the inspiration and part of like, it, it wasn't restrictive at all or, or constrictive. It was really um, kind of, as you said, Gregory, liberating. So, um, and um, I, is there, I, is there anything else that either of you would want to say about your films um, I, before we close? Anything else? Um, How about where well, do you, what do you plan to do next? Well, I'm currently working on like telling another like film, like maybe more comedic rather than like just for kids, but like related to like growing, growing up back home. Like it's about like the market, the fruit markets that you'll see in like Jamaica. So currently working on that. Mm, nice. Whenever I travel, food markets are one of the places I always, always go. Um, in fact, they're a fascinating way to find out about people. So um, 
And Bob, how about you? What are you working on? I'm working on a feature film. And in this story, I'm exploring American culture and how, and we're trying to show how love and forgiveness can be the solution to many challenges we face today. And this film is based in Shaw in Washington, DC and in West Virginia. Nice. Well, I wish you both the best um, and look forward to seeing your work in the future as well. And I thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And, um, you know, I also want to let everyone know that the Metro, all of the Metro shorts are part of the DC for Real program that's in Film Fest DC. And you're able to watch these films for free. So spread the okay. word to your friends. Sure and, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a really lovely thing in support of the community, of the filmmaking community in DC. So thank you all and good luck. I hope Bob drives safely wherever you're yes, off to thanks. next. <laughs> Definitely drive safely. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.